Hello, good morning, good afternoon, and welcome. Welcome if you're dialing in from somewhere across the world. Very excited uh, to have our guests here today and to talk about one of the areas where completely different disciplines are coming together uh, to make leaps uh, in science and in creativity. So um, I'm going to introduce our guests, and they're going to share a little bit about some of the stuff we've been doing together, and then we're going to try and have a conversation, hopefully involving uh, those of you in the room as well, about what's been going on. Um, I'm Matt Britton. If you don't know me, look after... Google Business and Operations in Europe, Middle East, and Africa. I'm wearing a suit. Uh, that's part of what I have to do. Apologies. Um, I first met uh, the team at the Natural History Museum in, in my day job about eight years ago uh, when I was running our UK business. And they were talking about what can we do with our collection in the digital world. There's probably something there. Now, it's taken them and us a bit of time to get our stuff together. Uh, but over a 10-month period, a team led by the Cultural Institute and uh, Zaya, his, who is here, and our Mitten team work with about 100 different teams of to people from teams across Google to help to digitize a whole bunch of natural history, uh, not just from the Natural History Museum, but from 60 different museums, uh, 300,000 uh, photos, videos, and documents from those museums uh, as part of Google Arts and Culture. And we're going to have a little bit of a look at some of that uh, later. And the Natural History Museum was a primary partner. And our guests today, uh, Ian Owens, who's here, uh, is uh, leading the Natural History Museum's work, um, uh, joined them from Imperial College. Uh, he's previously been at the Institute of Zoology in, uh, in Queensland, far north Queensland in Australia, the Zoological Society of London. He's a research fellow there. Uh, he, he sits on the Natural Environment Research Council's post-genomics and protein I don't even know what that is, proteomics, we'll find out about that, steering committee, a vice president of the Council of the British Trust for Ornithology, a trustee of the National Biodiversity uh, Network, and you oversee the work of 300 different scientists and a huge uh, collection of 70 million different specimens. We might talk a bit about that as well. That's right. Th th your CV's so long that I won't go through the whole <laughs> That's thing more than enough. That's um, there are lots of other things I don't understand on it as well. Yeah. Uh, and, and then Vince, uh, who's here, uh, started as an evolutionary biologist and is really leading the application of digital technologies to the study and taxonomy of biodiversity. And um, he's head of informatics at the Natural History Museum. That's probably not a role that was around when it was founded Definitely. Uh, back yeah. in the day. So we might talk about that as well. But first, could I invite Ian uh, to just share a little bit about the work that you've been doing, and then we'll have a, a, a chat. Sure. So I um, don't want this to turn into a lecture. I was in universities for 20 years. So I was warning Matt, I am prone to that. Um, but hopefully you all, you all know about the Natural History Museum. That's one of the pleasures of working here. You show this sort of image, you say where you're from. It's got a big brand globally. About um, 5 million people come here a year physically. About the same number of visitor exhibitions around the world. And about double that um, visitors digitally at the moment. So it's got a big brand. Now this place was founded, well, it's based on a collection um, from that was um, started in the um, 1600s. It started as the British Museum, so it was very much a product of the Age of Reason. Um, people coming out of a period when the uh, mythology and religion were the dominant um, ways of understanding the world. These sorts of institutions were really created to start to um, talk about the world rationally and explain it. Of course, one of the key parts of that was to find objects around the world, bring them to a big hub, and actually show them to, to people. So we've got a few slides here. We can dip in and out of these. I'll um, go through a few of them. This is what, if you think about the big hall at the front of the um, Natural History Museum, this is what's on the ceiling. It's absolutely beautiful. This actually tells a, quite an important point about our founding. This is a whole series of plants um, which are of um, industrial or medical importance. So these sorts of institutions were founded partly out of raw curiosity for the natural world and particularly for the history of the natural world. They were, all, they were always intended also to be a tool for exploration in terms of innovation as well. So things like cocoa plants, coffee, potatoes and so on, they all came through these sorts of institutions. The other thing of course, these institutions contain some unbelievably cool objects that have really changed the way that individuals have, have, have affected how we all think about the world here. So on the left here, one of some of my favorite specimens, those, are, those aren't just, we always joke, those aren't just any Darwin's finches, those are Darwin's Darwin's finches. So these are the sorts of objects that really started making us think about um, evolution and natural selection. 
<clears throat> that brown object at the top there is the first bit of dinosaur that somebody dug up and figured out what it was. There's a really nice story about they realized, my goodness, it's a lizard, but it's a lizard that's about 30 meters long. So that, that's the first dinosaur. Bottom there, that's the first non-human human that we um, dug up from Gibraltar when people started figuring out there were other humans around at some stage. And if you think about what that meant back in that time, we were the only human. The world had only been around a few thousand years, apparently, to suddenly say unambiguously and to show there were other humans around. That was an revo intellectually revolutionary moment. Um, and over here, Vince will probably talk about this. This is, um, this is we have this in there. This is one of um, Galap um, the Galapagos mockingbirds. Actually, it's these specimens, rather than the finches, that Darwin actually started thinking about evolution. He actually collected these things, and the next day in his notebook, when he wasn't being sick um, in the Beagle, he started to write little, what we would now call trees of life, and say, I think things change. So when you put these in front of people, as we do both physically and now through the Institute, you can always captivate people. First of all, about the object, and then about the people, but then it's the big idea. And of course, what we're interested in at the moment is it's no longer necessary to bring people to that institution in um, South Kensington. We want this to be available to anybody, anytime, anywhere. And that's all about digital and genomic technologies. Do you want me to? Uh, Please, I, I think, think it's fascinating. Just keep going for a minute. I okay, think it's we'll, do a, amazing. we'll do a couple of these. <clears throat> Here are some of the sorts of specimens and the sort of data that we work with. Huge collections of insects, 27 million um, pinned insects. It's pro I always joke with Vince, it's probably the most analog thing that I know in the world. If you want to get the, these, these um, insects have been incredibly important in um, demonstrating um, climate change. If you want to know what's on one of those um, labels and want the data behind that, you have to go to that object, lift up the specimen and write it out yourself. It's an amazingly analog system. It's been like that for, as I say, 250 years. Our job is to destroy that intellectual model and to make that information freely available. Oh, so I can see <coughs> there you, you've barcoded them now. Yeah, yeah so this is, we, we've um, had a project where we've barcoded, we've now digitized um, the UK Lepidoptera collections, so that's butterflies and moths to us. That's about 800,000 specimens. Um, it was a demonstration project to, say, to show that this can be done, and these are the sorts of pipelines that you need to set up um, to do it. So yes, that database is on, the, the best place to get to that database, to that data at the moment, would be through the Google Cultural Institute. 300,000 of them um, are on there. So we've started um, digitizing some of our collections. This also shows, so for example, with the recent Ebola um, outbreaks, one of the first things you need to figure out for something like Ebola is where did it come from? Almost everything that will really kill humans on a large scale is leaping across to humans from something else relatively recently. Ebola is an example of that, so when you try and figure out where that comes from, you, you, you realize it's from the fruit bats that live in that area, and you go back into the collection and say, how long has Ebola been in these fruit bats? You can use genetic techniques to extract that. So sometimes it's unexpected. It's not always systematic digitization. It's sometimes other things like that. Um, <coughs> uh, Drew might, um, Drew Purves is here from um, DeepMind. So, um, Drew probably recognizes this. You're a collaborator, collaborator in this project, aren't you? This is a big project called um, Predix. This is trying to mobilize the sort of data we've just been looking at to, first of all, map biodiversity in the world now, then figure out um, what our impact, what humanity's impact has been on that biodiversity, and then predict the future. So that's something that we're really interested in because we want to give people hope about the future as well as making them realize um, that there's some big decisions to be made. And the sort of analyses that these guys have been doing um, demonstrate that the decisions we make now could have a really big impact, not just over the next 100 years, but the next 50 years. But they are very data intensive compared to the sorts of studies that people used to do um, before. On here, um, we calculated the other day, there's the equivalent of about 65 million um, individual animals labeled put on this map. So that's, and that's the sort of data that you need. In the natural history collections around the world, there's probably between about one and a half and three billion data points, just from the specimens. That's not even going into the literature. <clears throat> okay, I'll probably stop on this slide. This is where the challenges start. So what we can do at the moment, we feel as though we know roughly what we want to do and we have some pipelines set up for doing that, be they physical or informatic. It's really scaling that up. So at the moment we're doing a few hundred thousand specimens. I think on the Google Cultural Institute, 
Today, there's about 300,000 specimens. That's a lot compared to what museums have done before. But if we're trying to get into the millions and the high millions, you need to you know, really scale that. Then that really becomes an informatic issue. This is a great example of this. This is about as bad as the collections get in terms of hard to change anything from analog into digital. Here's a typical curator. This is Max Barclay in charge of our Beetle collection. Fascinating stories. Some of his collection laid out in front of him. If you actually go and look at one of those objects, they're quite often like that. So you can see, in this case, a fly at the top there, and then you can see that set of labels underneath it. That's the metadata. In many cases, we're much more interested in that data than we are, to be honest, in the fly. We'd like a leg off the fly, get the genome from it, then we want the data. Now you can see at the moment what we do is we tend to one pick those labels, photograph them, and then start extracting information off that. That's okay for a few tens of thousands. For a few millions, you need to, you need to break that. Similarly, you can see the way that the different um, labels are um, uh, typed out or written there. You can see that, um, how are you gonna do that? You're really gonna transcribe that by hand? So at the moment, we sometimes use a curator, to, an expert, if you like, to transcribe that. But typically, we wanna apply OCR first. We wanna cut that image up, put it back together, um, use OCR to figure out what sort of lab uh, labels um, so we've got some um, image recognition software to look at what's a written label and what's a handwritten label. Then we want to use OCR on the, written, on the typed labels. Then we're starting to go down into the handwritten labels. We crowdsource some of that. Really fun crowdsourcing, but at the moment we can digitize things about 10 times as fast as we can crowdsource them. So we need to only be serving things to real humans that r need a real human's mind. We need to do everything we can without that human mind before that last resort, if you like. So that, uh, yeah, fascinating. I think all of us can understand <coughs> the parallels between the sort of tagging taxonomy, yeah. uh, structured data set, and the ingestion of large amounts of data. And we'll talk a bit more about some of that. Maybe let's just end by looking at one of the ways in which the teams work with you to try to make this stuff more accessible. Uh, I think we've got a little video of the Romaliosaurus. Ah, do you want uh, to flip to that, that now? Can we, can we go and have a quick look at that? Because I think the other part of what we're trying to do is obviously increase people's interest and accessibility to this. So let's have a look at this. Many of you have seen some of this, but do have a look, if you haven't, at the uh, Arts and Culture app and these collections. They're really uh, sensational, and, and it's a sense that we're just starting the journey of what's possible. Uh, I wanted to ask you, Vince, uh, about your personal journey, because as an evolutionary <coughs> biologist, to become the uh, head of the informatics division, how did that start? And so, yeah, that's a bit of a leap about in the journey. some ways. I mean, I started perhaps like, I guess, like many um, PhD students in, in, in the UK with an interest in the natural world, and I wanted to find a, an interesting project to work on. And the group that I chose to work on um, was uh, a rather obscure insect group called parasitic lice. So we're familiar with them as the parasites that live in our, uh, sometimes live in our school children's hair and are very difficult to get rid of. But they're a really fascinating group because they've co-evolved with their hosts over millions and millions of years. And when I started to work on them, there was very little known about them. So I started a database. I started um, very crude and rudimentary digital techniques to try and uh, build that, that, put that data together. It was also at a time when the web was almost just being born. When, when was this? This is about 2000. Okay. So about 1997 to 2000, I did my PhD. And um, the web was just being explored as a scientific tool. And increasingly, we needed to build databases to share that information, to make it accessible, to make it 
curatable. Right, so this is actually at the time when the web was being used in the way that it was designed by, you know, effectively by Tim in terms of uh, it, research. Exactly. Uh, and um, I started to, because there were no easy to use tools that are out there, I really had to build those systems myself. So very simple systems, sharing information about specimens, images, molecular data, and trying to do that in a way that would bring in many of my colleagues, because as you can imagine, there aren't many Laos authorities around the, uh, in the UK. They tend to be very widely scattered. I needed to communicate with them, and I needed to be able to bring their expertise to this database. And then over time, of course, I realized that the, the rather parochial little problem that I had in trying to understand the evolution of this group was a pa in parallel, really, to everybody, other, all the other authorities working on other taxonomic groups. And so we started, instead of building systems just to study parasitic lice, we started to build platforms, platforms that would work for other taxonomic groups. And that was when I started to get very seriously interested in digital. And was there a moment where where you could see the potential of this technology? I mean, obviously, you, you started because you were just doing your own cataloging, and then you start to connect with others. Was there a moment where you started to go, oh, I can see how big this could I be? I think um, probably that moment was when I started to collaborate on a, a, a global project called um, the Tree of Life to actually share that information on what was it at the time, it still exists actually, a pretty rudimentary website where we were trying to share data about the evolutionary history of taxonomic groups. And a, a, an, envir uh, an evolutionary biologist in the US had built this platform that was critical to um, building those evolutionary trees and allowed us to share that data. And then I started to collaborate on that project. And that was probably the epiphany moment when I started to realize there's really something in this for or many other taxa in terms of how we do this at a global level. But it all started with lice. It all started with this very curious group of about 5,000 species of parasites on about 5,000 species of mammal, about 10,000 species of bird, and about 12,000 associations between those. And as a, as a student, basically, trying to manage all of that data, trying to extract that from the scientific literature, that's an enormous task. But you break it up into small enough chunks yep. and you distribute the problem, yep. and actually it becomes a tractable problem. Fantastic. And now tell us a bit more about where you are today and the focus that you have today with the digital portal, with all the specimens that you're in, in the process of digitizing. So I think there's two big challenges now. So I lead the informatics group within the museum, and I think we have two big challenges, one of which Ian alluded to and is beautifully illustrated there, just the sheer scale of the collection, the enormity of this physical collection and trying to digitize that. That insect um, that you see, that pinned insect, that fly there, is a good example of digitizing that through traditional methods, takes about two minutes and 20 seconds to take all of those labels off, to take a photograph, to get a rudimentary transcription. And what we really want to do is speed that process yeah. up. So robotics um, that can potentially help using um, uh, tools that are able to allow us to digitally reconstruct the label without physically having to take them off. Unfortunately, some of those labels are folded, so alas, we can't so get a mechanical. Pro uh, anybody here work on the books project? So the early days of our book scanning project was basically Larry and Sergey arguing about how quickly you could digitize a book. And, and using a photocopier to sort of figure yeah. out the mechanics of doing it. It's very much the same kind of problem here. Exactly it's very, it's a very rudimentary problem in some ways, but I think things like computer vision, for example, are critical to then helping stitch some of those images together. So we can use a rig where we can take a number of oblique images yeah. of that specimen, automatically stitch it together, run OCR, run handwriting recognition across that, and that pool of material that then fails those tests, we then put through to our crowdsourcing so that then humans can start intervening so the, and getting the, that data. The, the first key challenge is the uh, large-scale digitization of those artifacts and, uh, and species, uh, specimens yeah. and so on. Yeah. And, and what else are the... So the next things? big challenge, I think, is how do we exploit that data? How do we meaningfully get data um, from particularly that imagery? So there is a, um, a huge opportunity, I think, in terms of computer vision, in terms of trying to recognize in an automated way what those objects are and then apply that across all sorts of science across, uh, across the globe. So of course we have the authoritative collection of all of the uh, roughly two million species that have been described so far and we can potentially get imagery for 
sometimes tens, sometimes hundreds of thousands of those specimens. So being able then to use that imagery to facilitate things like automatic species recognition. So that imagine someone, um, a, a member of the public, perhaps innocently taking a photograph out on the Serengeti or yeah. basically wherever they are, and being able to automatically recognize what's in that image and exploit that. That has a huge transformative potential in terms of helping us to understand the natural world, what's there, when it was and there. I, I suspect some of us were thinking that when you were showing, uh, when Ian was showing the Lepidoptera and thinking, well, how far away are we from just being able to use a camera to identify? How, how far away are we? And does it vary by species or? So it really varies by taxon. Okay. So some um, taxa, some groups lend themselves to that. So uh, butterflies and moths in particular, Lepidoptera, because they're quite two dimensional and many of the key characteristics you can see in, um, uh, in that image, you can actually get species recognition, or certainly recognition to some of the lower taxa. For other groups, it's much, much harder. There's much more three-dimensionality to them. The discriminating features are tucked away, are hidden away. Getting at that information is harder. But that's the potential. Right, and, and if we step from what you're doing to, to Ian's role, which is as Director of Science, what are the things that most excite you and the, the big challenges that you're focusing on? In this area. There's also um, the public aspect of this. Yeah. So we all, the, you know, when you look at that museum to begin with, this, we are a scientific institution, but we also want to get pe the broad public interested in these sorts of things. And there's a selfish reason for that, because if we think that if you want to make politicians and so on bold enough to make dis good decisions for the long-term environment, you need to get the public interested in that. And lots of events show there's a long way to uh, go with that. So things like the Romelia Saurus we were just looking at there, that's an amazing way of literally bringing an iconic specimen to life. So that specimen is in, the, is in one of our main halls. It was collected um, right at the beginning of this discovery period by a woman called Mary Anning. So great story behind it. But by using that bit of VR to bring it to, to life, to give that to schools and so on, it lets you tell some really interesting stories. And if you watch the video, I've showed it now to goodness knows how many um, people of all sorts of ages. They're totally captivated. To begin with, they like the buzz of what they put on the cardboard. They like that. Then they see the VR. They like that. That's um, still sufficiently new to, inter to interest them. The creature comes towards them. Almost everybody kind of, oh, you know, a bit scared by it. But then afterwards, there's a narrative about the natural world and about the oceans. Mm -hmm. That's afterwards, that's what they want to ask you about. So it's really, really interesting. You couldn't do a better thing with a specimen than that series of events. And the cool thing about that, of course, is, well, we do that all the time with people that are lucky enough to be standing talking to us in South Kensington. But if you want to change society's minds about things, it has to, it has to be more than that. And that's what that really demonstrates. And so you, you are organizing the natural world's information and making it accessible and useful to everyone, which That's I guess right. would ring true to us as well. Yeah. Um, and do you worry about, I need to get people to the museum versus if I digitize things, they won't come? Or what's your experience been of, of well, I think our experience affects? is actually the opposite. Yeah. Yeah. So the moment that you start to digitize things, and we see this, for example, with our loans. So we're in one sense, we're a rather curious museum. Many museums are about preserving and holding on to things. We're busy sending tens of thousands of specimens out on academic loans every year. And actually, the experience is when you digitize those and you make digitized copies of those available, you actually get more. Uh, loan requests, more engagement, not less. So I think quite the opposite, actually. I think digital brings many more people physically in to uh, engage with our collections. And I think that's one of the interesting things in music. We see that an explosion in people going and seeing music live, as well as having yeah. every recorded song in history in their in their pocket. So it seems that one drives the other. Yeah. Uh, and what are the other challenges you face in terms of the public engagement? I, I guess. I'm not going to mention any of the political events of this week, <laughs> but uh, you know we're in a world where things may go backwards rather than forwards in some of these agendas. What's the what's the best way for you to connect with the policymakers and get ongoing support? Because this stuff costs. It was started by the amateurs and That's by right. the by the filthy rich, but but now this is a real cost to it. Yeah. How do you how do you deal with the policy making challenge and the funding challenge? Here? So that's um, it's a good question, Matt. The um, the um, the challenge with respect to the public and the policymakers is, as I said when I started this, is not to feel as though you're lecturing them. If they come into the museum or they come onto our different sorts of products and they feel that they know this is going to be a lecture about giving more aid with respect to diseases or climate change or habitat um, usage and so on, they veer away from that. So as with 
lots of different media advertising, for example. You've got to get a smart way into their head, get the hook into their head, and then start to talk. And then once they're interested, talk to them about the bigger piece. So you can see that the sorts of objects we were just talking about there, they're fascinating. Um, they've got some interesting scientific points about them, but they're a way into people's heads. And that's the way we often use it. In terms of funding and so on, what we see um, the way of funding these sorts of um, missions is a combination of government support and then getting different sorts of entrepreneurial support. So if you look around the world, the institutions that have done most digitization typically so far, they've usually been doing that based on um, substantial government support. I'd say the limitation of that is that doesn't necessarily make you very innovative. You get 10 million bucks to do your botanical collection, so you do that and then you stop doing it. What we want to create is a set of platforms that anybody can do it anywhere and it's much cheaper and so on um, to do that. So I see that sweet spot as the government support plus different sorts of entrepreneurial ventures as well. So go on. Please. Yeah I was just going to add I mean, and I think one the, the one cap on top of that also is some really great science which demonstrates why this data is so important and that slide that we had just earlier the, the work actually that Drew was involved in demonstrating that we have lost significant fractions of biodiversity and that if we continue along that path we will lose uh, at increasing rate that biodiversity is a great illustration. So I was going to ask you a bit more about that exactly at this point actually so uh, t tell us more about how you're using the data you have the historic data to um, extrapolate future trends and to highlight these issues. What are the challenges there? What's it showing us? So that project used um, a, a mixture of basically data mining, but very human intensive, rather laborious actually data mining. So an <laughs> army of students raided lots of scientific literature that was basically showing changing patterns of, um, of the biodiversity before and after land use change. And by knowing what was there, and by knowing what was there now, and being able to classify those different habitats, we can start to then see where there's been the most biodiversity loss, and we can also start to model how uh, future things like climate change scenarios, for example, are going to impact that loss. Because the good news, and there is some good news from this, is that some of those climate change scenarios can mitigate that rate of loss, and we can actually start to repair some of the damage that we've been doing. Let's hope so. It, t tell us a bit more about what's shown here and about the work that you're doing you know, with the machine learning experts. Do you want, want to talk about that? Or? So this is, a, um, this, is a, um, this is just a terrestrial world at the moment, uh, but this is showing um, the percentage of original um, flora and fauna that are still there. So um, if you, um, I think that's the way around it is, yes. So if you've got a, a blue number, that means that a large proportion, a blue colour, that's um, a large proportion of the species are still intact. Um, as it gets redder, it means that an increasingly large proportion have been lost. Now, there's all sorts of different ways you can add those numbers up, obviously. The main conclusions to this are pretty robust to those sorts of differences in exactly which species you include. Now, what you can see is the global average is that we've lost about 13% um, or so of species. What you can also see is that's incredibly heterogeneously distributed. There are some areas, often where there's relatively low species, that are relatively intact. There are also places such as the Amazon Basin there that you can see that are intact. You can see there are some other areas that are incredibly disturbed. Now at the moment, one of the interesting things, stroke terrifying things, is we don't actually know what the function looks like mm -hmm. between this um, type of species count and ecological functioning. Now these guys have also been doing some work Another index called um, where they're trying to actually um, estimate the effects of this on ecosystems. That's an unexplored, well, it's very exciting, but a relatively unexplored area. So we don't know whether there are people called tipping points in this system or whether there are linear relationships and so on. One of the other cool things about natural history collections is they are literally a time machine. So they're one of, well, they're one of very few un un unambiguous ways that you can go back a few hundred years and map what's been happening. And those few hundred years that we've been around collecting things, or our ancestors have been around collecting things, of course, was exactly the moment when Western civilization started going around the world and driving a lot of this. So it's a, I suppose it's a fortunate accident that the same time we started exploiting the world and doing this to it, we were collecting through that period. So it's a time machine. The, the, um, the challenge now is to open that up. Now, we've done some of that analytically, so we can push some of these graphs back to about 1,500 using some 
um, generalizations about the way the world works with respect to the sort of um, habitats that are there. But these collections offer the opportunity to be much more specific than that as well. Well, um, can, can you say a little bit about how you've collaborated <coughs> either with the DeepMind team or with, with the Google teams? What's that been like? How easy was it to just, oh, it's obvious we need to do this, and how much was it trying to figure out a way of working? So come, be I'll honest. Say, oh, oh, yes, no, I, well, I, it's, it's, there are good things to say, so it's easy to be honest. When we first started talking to each other, um, yes, there's that classic cultural difference about you know, what's important and so on. I found that... Well, I found that a mixture of incredibly rewarding and very, very challenging. So sometimes I'll talk to a couple of your guys, um, and they will start to ask me, so why do, you, why do you bring botanical specimens back to the museum? I say, well, we've been doing it for 200 years, young man. Of course that's the way we do it. But once you go through the whole um, flow of why you're doing it, the information that you get, say, we could capture all of that in the field now. You realize the only reason to actually bring the specimen back is just as a voucher for all of that information. So sometimes it completely changes how you think. And to be honest, for an institution that's 200 years old, that's one of the big things you've got to be doing. You've got to be challenging yourself on very fun, you know, why collect? And if you're going to collect tomorrow, why the hell are you going to collect the same way as you did 200 years ago? You should throw that out and completely rethink it. And secondly, for well, you, is, yeah, you guys work quickly yeah. in a very, very nimble way. So we like to plan projects, get plenty of paperwork there, maybe plan it again and that sort of thing. And you know, we'll do that over a couple of years. Um, Where well, you guys are kind of saying, so I remember when we were doing the um, Romeliosaurus there, let's do, let's do a VR of this. Okay, that's a, kind of, that's a, you know, that's a good idea. Um, this is what it would involve. Okay, you know, we were thinking six months, a year. So let's do it by the end of the week. Now for us, that's an unbelievably challenging timescale, but it's been good, hasn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Really? I mean, I think that agility was what I was going to pick up on. I think generally in science, particularly digital science, we're used to having to work quite quickly. So in one sense, that wasn't such a problem. But working with some of the other bits of the museum, which are maybe not quite uh, so comfortable with that, um, uh, th that degree of speed of working. I remember with the tank room, it was quite literally <coughs> the decision was made the night before to do the filming. So being able to turn the museum around to secure the permissions necessary to do that filming and literally to be in there the following morning, that is quite a challenge for we us. Sh we showed to her this amazing room that you go into which has got historical samples all around it, absolutely wonderful <coughs> place, with a wonderful curator that knows every specimen. There's the original coelacanth and things in there. Like we showed this to her, I think it was about five o'clock by the time we got there and Ollie was telling his stories. And we said, why don't we put this on the Cultural Institute? So what? He says, have you got an objection? I said, I've got no objection, but how are we going to do that? He goes, if I can get the right team here, I think it's 8 o'clock the next morning, can we film this and do the videos and do the 3D modeling? So if you can get your team here by 8 o'clock, we'll be here. Yeah. And we did it the next morning. Now, we've been trying to do that, well, certainly since I've been at the museum. So to be able to accelerate things at that pace and to have that attitude and those resources, to be able to ha really have that team the next morning knocking on the door, and they were incredible. Yeah, and I was, I was actually just watching that. It's a 360 <coughs> video, and is, right. it, is it Ollie, the, the, Ollie the, yeah. the curator of all things fish? <laughs> That's right. Uh, and it's brilliant because it's extremely accessible. He's a natural. Yeah. I mean, he's, he should be on television, and, he, <laughs> and, now he, uh, and now he is. So that's part of making it uh, accessible. Yeah. And uh, any difficulties? I mean, there's this, obviously there's a pace thing, there's a bit of an agility thing you mentioned. A any difficulties where we were just at cross purposes or, or the agenda that our teams had was, was just at odds with what was going to drive your work forward? I don't think, they are, I don't think there are um, major differences like that. I think it, the challenge eventually is prioritization. So whenever we're in a room together, we can come up with 20 cool ideas. And then it's a case of... Just okay. 20. <laughs> it was a short meeting. <laughs> and then it's a case of figuring out, okay, which ones are we going to um, work on? Work on next, really. So that's what... Which is an exciting challenge. So I want to come to the audience and get any questions or suggestions or thoughts you have. So just raise your hand and Jan has a mic if you want to do any of that. While you're having a think about really smart questions. Uh, just coming, coming back to you and, and, and the, the work that you're doing, what, what do you see as being the biggest areas of potential next? You've talked a bit about the kind of near-term challenges, but where do you think this could go? So, I mean, I think ultimately the really grand challenge is not what, what we've talked about here 
is uh, obviously relevant to the Natural History Museum, but there are literally hundreds, thousands of Natural History Museums all around the globe that have entirely the same problem. Ian talked right at the beginning about that figure of roughly 1.5 to 3 billion specimens in natural history collections. So how do we take our problem that we have at the Natural History Museum and build solutions that work for all of those institutions to try and extract that data. Because for me, the really grand vision, if you like, as to what we're going to do with all of that data is to try to model the natural world. So by that, I mean take literally every facet of information that we've possibly got, everything about the taxonomy, the evolutionary history, the traits of the phenotypic traits, the morphological traits of the specimens, the genotypic information, all of the abiotic information as well, and start to model that so that we have a very precise understanding of what the natural world is, what's happening to it, and how can we mitigate the risks about the to the natural world. That is probably the ultimate and most inclusive grand challenge because it basically encompasses all the scientists involved in the study of the natural world, all the institutions, all the collections, and also the tremendous body of literature that we've already generated on this. In a curious way, our science is a little bit unusual to a number of other science, sciences in that a lot of the documentation about the natural world, even if it was written 300 years ago, is still highly relevant today. Now, you can't say that about physics or astronomy. <coughs> But you can say that about our science. So we have 300 million pages of text, pretty much, that have been that represent the corpus of knowledge that have been written so far about the natural world. We have a big program to digitize that. We've done about 50 million of those pages so far. Um, but trying to then extract meaning, semantic meaning from that, is also a, a huge opportunity. But that grand vision is to really bring it all together in an integrative way so that we have effectively a tool for the whole of the scientific community. Study. It's striking when you talk, I mean, it, I think we see this in many areas that when different disciplines come together, that's when creativity and innovation really happens. It, you talk in a way that I've not seen biologists talk about platforms and data mm. uh, and applying that to, to problems. Are others uh, in your field starting to do the same thing or, or are you uh, as the Brits leaving th the world? I think, well, I think they're beginning to, but the challenge also is, is partly they're one of resources. So it's relatively easy for someone to innovate digitally and to do something in a very sort of project-oriented way. It usually takes, depending upon the nature of the, the initiative, maybe five or ten times the amount of resource to actually build a robust platform that will then work and scale in a sensible way. So I think in terms of leadership, yes, we probably are leading the way in some of those um, development of some of those platforms. But I think it's partly also we're often trying to serve many different audiences. We have to build projects. Often it's more project oriented than program or um, platform oriented and trying to bridge that gap between, if you like, the project and the program. That's the hard bit, that scaling bit, something that Google, of course, have done so well. Uh, I'm just thinking I could be talking to one of, our, <laughs> one of my colleagues. Uh, questions, thoughts, suggestions for the guests? Jan. Um, yeah, so you were talking about the loss of biodiversity. Um, I assume there are people who say, why should I care that there are only 84 flies where there used to be 100 flies? Um, so what do you reply to those people? That's a very hard one to answer. Um, actually, I remember, uh, I remember that same query being made on a Radio 4 program to a very eminent scientist, actually, a few years ago. And he, he actually, uh, well, he was rather colourful in his language in terms of how he replied, because the truthful answer is, we often don't know. You could imagine each of these species as being like a book full of pages that we've yet to read. Now, we don't know what the value is necessarily in preserving or keeping all of those species. We can talk in a cultural and a social sense about general um, value of biodiversity, but the specifics of that particular fly is very hard to pin down. All I can say is that if you imagine each of those species was like a library, you would not burn the library just because you hadn't read it. You'd probably at least read it first. So that's one answer. I don't know whether you've got a better one. <laughs> <coughs> no, that's, um, well, the, the other answer we use is we often go into, uh, if, if it's somebody who wants an answer from a very human perspective, then what we often use is the concept of ecosystem services. So we know that at some stage, if you carry on doing this, 
eventually you were going to screw up in a, to an enormous degree. Because almost everything, if you ask, you know, what you ate this morning, what you're dressed in, everybody here, I would imagine, unless you haven't had anything to eat yet, will have had some plants to eat this um, this morning, be it through bread or through cereals or whatever that might be. You'd be dressed in things that come from plants um, and so on. Now at the moment, those systems, um, we, can, we can still harvest those systems. The water that you get will have come through some sort of um, natural um, system as well. Almost all the resources that you ultimately rely on, including the resources that are in technical devices and so on, they're coming from natural systems. Now at the moment, we are, we are just stirring that bucket, if you like, at a fairly vigorous rate. And so far, we can see things going wrong, but we can still harvest it. We don't yet know how long we can keep doing that. We can use this map, of course, to demonstrate between different sites, sites with good intactness and sites with poor intactness with respect to species demonstrate ecosystem services really start to deteriorate. I mean, so that's the kind of more strategic answer, if you like, that if everything that we depend on is ultimately a natural system on this planet, um, and we need, to, we need to keep that intact for humanity. And there are some systems that are exceedingly vulnerable at the moment. <coughs> so coral reefs would be a great example of that. We're about to hit a tipping point due to um, uh, rising sea temperature and ocean acidification, which probably means that by about 2050, virtually every single coral reef will have very significant damage. And some will just simply be wiped out because their tolerance to that environmental change is just simply too narrow. They can't cope. So many of those, all, all the services that are uh, dependent from tourism, from fishing, from the ornamental fish trade uh, through uh, to, um, uh, yeah, th there's a, a world of um, economic loss that will also happen when we lose those coral reefs. I guess this kind of modelling will allow us to understand things like if we don't honour the Paris Climate Agreement, for example, what kind of implications there could be yeah, to yeah, extrapolate yeah, Exactly. This. One of the really interesting, I mean, you, you asked before, Matt, about effectively how to influence policymakers. Yeah, I don't know why it's on my mind, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, putting aside some um, challenging examples, another um, area I think that we need to get smarter in, as, as well as getting a kind of the, the suitable hook into their mind, we also need to give them solutions as well as problems. Um, and some of the work that comes out of this project is really interesting in that respect, in that you're probably all familiar with, the, with the, what's called the hockey stick curves um, for climate change. So it goes um, from relatively cool in the past, and it goes up at an alarming rate. That's why it's called the hockey stick curve. And at the right-hand side there, it's got different scenarios. It's usually got four to six different scenarios. As a biologist, I look at that with real envy because that looks like, ah, oh, you're really modeling the physical world there. You know, you've got a bit of climate, you've got a bit of historical climate data, you've inferred some climate data and so on. Now, what the team um, behind this have done is they've taken that challenge and said, we should be able to model the biological world in the same way. We should know what's happened in the past. We should be able to calculate what's happening now and most importantly, predict what's happening in the future based on exactly the same scenarios that they're using for climate change and so on, which are usually based on things like how many people there are, what you're doing with respect to reforestation and carbon storage, um, what you're doing with respect to burning fossil fuels and so on. And that's what that team have done. So you can now show a similar biodiversity curve, which from 1500, it goes along, it comes down in a really alarming fashion as we um, spread our agriculture around the world which also drives this pattern here. But then the different curves at the end there that predict what would happen under different future worlds, they are really different. Some of them just continue to go down. So you're heading, I would say you're heading there towards an ecosystem crisis. You're gonna get major services collapsing. But even under some of the models that are, being, uh, that are being used now, some of them are curving up within 50 years. And one of the main drivers for that is about how we reforest and how we look after carbon and so on. So there you can say to policymakers, instead of saying it's all a disaster, you're going to have to spend a lot of money, but it's probably not during your term, not very attractive, you can say, you guys can save the world. Look at this. If you reforested in this way and drove your fuel policies in this way, within 50 years, people are going to be, having a, people are going to be feeling the difference on a global scale. We haven't really been able to do that um, before because suddenly it becomes a doable challenge. And 50 years, okay, it's outside the normal election, election cycle, sure. Uh, but I think 50 years is the sort of time period that people realise, well, that's either me or my kids. It's yeah. certainly my grandkids. 
So it's a tangible period that you can make a difference. And it's, um, and it's very visually compelling when you do that. So I think that's one of our challenges, to, present so to find solutions and present them in a way that policymakers can work with them. Well, great, and we got there from flies. Uh, <laughs> other questions? Here we go. Um, so on that graph, how come Europe doesn't seem to be as devastated as like Australia or America? Okay, so um, can you guess why Australia is bright red, particularly the centre of Australia there? Ozone layer? Sorry? Um, so, so ozone layer, climate change will have affected Sheep. a lot of this. Sheep and rabbits have had an enormous effect on the species that would live in Australia. So if you introduce species by us, have devastated the, bio, the biota of, in, of the middle um, of Australia. Um, so sometimes you get massive effects like that. Um, you can see often it's associated um, with um, the, the, best, the best way usually of destroying biodiversity is to suddenly is to have an area that's quite bi biodiverse rich and suddenly try to um, increase um, the gross domestic product of that area because then you basically just have to take every resource out of that. Now places um, like Europe, we're not an enormously diverse area. We, are, we have relatively protected landscapes compared to um, some areas, so we still have some of our biodiversity um, left. Um, if you look across um, North America, you can see where that big belt is through the middle there. Anybody had the pleasure of driving across the center of America? You can see what's kind of been going on there. There's mass industrial size um, agriculture. Very difficult for biodiversity to cope with. And of things like the advances in artificial nitrogen fixing and, and productivity, you, met, you alluded to that there, but to just tell us a little bit more about how those kind of practices have affected this as far as you understand. Okay, so I mean, th what's going to affect this in the future, um, a lot of this is to do with um, it's a couple of big effects. It's how many people um, you have around, um, how well you control the climate, and how you manage those habitats. Now clearly, the, you know, from an environmental perspective, <laughs> The ideal thing is to have a relatively low number of people um, to control the environment and then to uh, manage those habitats in a way that is relatively sustainable. And it's achieving the balance across those things. I mean, I don't think any of us are saying we don't want to harvest new materials. If you look through, um, for example, South America there, you can, one of the challenges with the changes in Colombia, for example, absolutely amazing biodiversity in Colombia. Mm. One of the reasons it probably exists in some areas is it would be far too dangerous to go in there. You know, I've discussed with them in the past saying, how about we explore there and how about we explore and say, you do not want to go through that valley with your binoculars in your, you know, little <laughs> you tube. You <laughs> Yeah. So in those sorts of, there's also amazing minerals in Colombia, um, which will power the technologies that a lot of us are um, dependent upon. That's where the new batteries and the new screens and so on are going to come from, from those sorts of things. Our challenge is to try to be able to extract those minerals in a sustainable way, but keep the biodiversity as intact as possible. That's really challenging, but it's very conspicuous that um, already, since those deals are starting to happen in Colombia, they are over here talking to us about exactly how to do that. So you're talking about major areas of um, South America where you can make a difference about how biodiversity is going to go there in the next 10 years or so. Really exciting, but they need data. So it's, go it's going to be a data-driven solution that they're after. Uh, other questions? Hi. Uh, so my wife is a zoological research fellow, and uh, she, at the various universities she's gone to, uh, the state of the art for recording data tends to be an Excel spreadsheet at the top end. Um, <laughs> reducing down to, she does bird, ring bird ringing, and mm. bird ringing is often just recorded on scraps of paper which are mailed to each other. Um, what can we do and what can you do to help improve the, uh, the recording and the uh, sharing of high quality data from the academic community? So I think, I mean, I'll, I'll try and answer that one. I think fundamentally it's platforms, it's building platforms that support the acquisition of that data, the fact that it needs to be done offline because many of the places where people are doing that recording, they don't have digital connectivity. The synchronization and integration of that data is a big challenge. Um, so yeah, I, I, I feel your pain to some degree because I've been involved in that community for quite some time. Um, often there are communities of practice that are quite difficult to change. There's a cultural problem there as well in terms of trying to shift people away from bits of paper to recording things natively uh, digitally. There's also issues about devices. When you bring devices, particularly into some parts of the field, 
you know, they, they're going to get wet, it's extremely hot, it's humid, uh, or sometimes it's freezing cold. Um, the issue about connectivity is, is also critical. We've had to, in some cases, build really big temporary Wi-Fi networks. Uh, we do some work in Lyme Regis, and just on the beach, there is no good connectivity. <laughs> so you need to put in basic infrastructure, like a Wi-Fi network, just to be able to get citizens to help recording and documenting um, uh, what's on the beach. So um, I think Google, uh, organizations like ourselves, other natural history based organizations in the UK uh, have a key role in trying to um, uh, build those systems, those platforms to try and deliver that um, transition toward digital. But it's, it's, a, it's a challenge, partly because it's a cultural thing. It's not really a technology thing. Another question here, I think. Thanks. Um, so we were talking about environmental policy before, and I guess one of the biggest challenges is that it only really works is if all the countries around the world work together and pull in the same direction. And I guess is this something you're trying to do by making your collection available online, or how can we use that to convince people around the world? So uh, there is a very strong link between all those natural history collections worldwide. It, it tends to start, it tends to be kind of at the continental level, predominantly the conversations. So for example, I sit on an organization called CTAF, the Consortium of European Taxonomic Facilities, which represents the 50 major natural history collections across about 20 countries in Europe. And we talk constantly about basically how we can share technologies, we can develop a common agenda uh, to, um, uh, to, to, to basically provide the data, the platforms, the systems to make this kind of science possible. So I would say at that level there's very good communication. I think where there is perhaps slightly less, but obviously us being here today is a good example of where we're trying to bridge that, is with the commercial sector and with technology organizations who can really have a pivotal role in helping us to um, make that leap towards making this content more accessible, more digital, and support the underlying, it provides some of the underlying infrastructure, which is quite hard for us to provide individually, but through organizations like Google, there is a potential to, um, to provide. So let's give you that opportunity then. What would be the questions you'd ask of us as a partner in some of that journey? Where can you see that we have the most potential to be helpful? So, I, I mean, I think there's a number of them. Uh, the, probably the three big ones are digitization, just simply trying to exploit some of the digitization technologies that you've got. Obviously, you have the enormous experience with um, the book digitization. This is quite a different proposition in one sense, but there are many parallels, so that's one. I think the foundational platforms, the hosting, the storage, the cloud infrastructure, that's a big challenge for us because it's truly global, but again, it's an area where Google can help. And I think the other big one is helping us to demonstrate the potential of a lot of this digital content. And that's where I think the machine learning, the computer vision, the um, technologies that can help us to exploit and extract data from all of this imagery that we're data generating, that's the third big area, I think. That it sounds like that third area splits into sort of the, the intelligent extrapolations and so on that can engage on the policy and public front, as well as the yeah. captivating animations that, that bring in Absolutely. Uh, so we can engage that consumers. public and do the science and really tell the public about that science. And, and Suhair is here from the Cultural Institute team. Do you want to just give a wave? So if people want to sort of say, hey, I'd love to help follow up on this, then that's the place to, that's the place to talk. Any final questions from anybody? We're about to be out of time. Okay, so I have a, I have a f final question. Uh, you know, given where you are in your field and the progress that you're seeing made, what would you predict in sort of 10 years' time is going to have been a, a breakthrough uh, that's, that could be achieved in, in any of the fields that you're working in? Where, where do you see that there's some, some potential for something significant to change? I think digitally for me, it's the potential for um, species or taxon <coughs> recognition Im in images. I think that's going to be truly transformative to the kind of science that we can do because it empowers people who are frankly not necessarily very informed about the natural world to suddenly be able to record and document it. If we can automatically do things like identify species from that imagery, that has, it revolutionizes field work, for example. Imagine the fact that we have to send physically lots of people out to these sometimes very dangerous places to do that work. 
we can basically put devices into those places and do that recording in an automated way. We can do things like identify when new things that we didn't know about have come into a region, when things that um, maybe some of those are new species, maybe some of those things are um, uh, uh, things that we simply didn't know were there. That is going to have a huge transformative impact, I think, on how we understand the natural world. So the, the entire planet becomes your collection? Exactly, yeah. Amazing. And uh, do you have a similar view? Um, I have to be a bit different from Vince. I agree with that. It's a bit, that's you know, the new expedition, the new global expedition using new technologies. So the one thing I would add to what we've spoken about so far is everything we've just spoken about now, you also link that to genomic information. So we also want to understand how life evolved and how it worked now. I would say that you guys would probably know more about this than me, but if you think about um, where we are in terms of digital technology, um, genomes have been going along a similar trajectory. The old, the old approach was kind of, let's try and get one genome for one species. We've done it. Now we've got um, genomes for maybe 100 species. Jolly good. Now we're starting to do a little bit of population, so 1,000 or 10,000 humans get a bit of variety in there. Really exciting years. But in the same way as technology has got faster and better in the digital realm and cheaper, exactly the same has happened in the genomic realm as well. So now we're into biodiversity genomics. So you look at the forms of all the different animals and plants around you, we want to understand how that happened and what it means for their evolution, and again, for their responses to future change. So there's a big database over there that's growing really rapidly, all about genomes. This is where a lot of the information is actually, the, the biological information is stored. We've got to link those two together, and I think there's going to be a lot of fun doing that. Well, I want to say, I mean, thank you for enduring my simplistic questions, but there's a real sense here of a field that is ready for a, a big uh, acceleration um, at a time which we uh, probably need it more than ever. So I want to say a big thank you to Dr. Ian Owens, Dr. Vince Smith for all their time and for our partnership with the Natural History Museum. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you.